all wonderful person. This is Anton. And well, generally, it's actually really, really difficult for me to sometimes find the right words to use when I'm discussing some sort of a tragic event. In this case, it's the event that a lot of you are probably already familiar with based on a lot of media reports from August of last year. The absolutely insane explosion that happened in the port of Beirut that essentially created one of the largest non-nuclear explosions to ever occur on the planet. And in the last few months, several scientists wanted to investigate this particular explosion from a scientific perspective. And specifically looking at various effects that this explosion produced in the atmosphere. Now, a lot of these videos were shared by this wonderful person, this wonderful international correspondent, Borzu Daragahi, who published all of these videos on his Twitter and you can actually find all of them in the description below. But for this video, I really wanted to focus on some of the facts we've discovered over the past few months and also just generally talk about what this explosion created in terms of the atmospheric effects. Now, first of all, as you might already know, this is not the most powerful explosion to occur. That record goes to the infamous Tsar Bomba that was exploded by the Soviet Union. And in terms of the most powerful non-nuclear explosions, the record for that goes to the Halifax explosion that occurred in 1917 in the city of Halifax in Canada, when a boat carrying various ammunitions from World War I ended up destroying most of the city of Halifax, creating a tremendous amount of damage in the process. But according to at least one study from last year, the explosion that happened in Beirut was about half as strong, yet produced a lot of effects that were not observed in some of the other explosions. In other words, despite its lower yield, it actually seemed to have been more powerful overall. And also ended up producing a humongous crater that you can kind of see in this image from Google Maps. But before we talk about the details of some of these studies, what exactly happened here and what exactly exploded? Because obviously that's really where the story should start. Well, it turns out this is a very tragic story of a lot of incompetence and a lot of mismanagement, which essentially led to tragic loss of life. The story starts right here with this ship known as Rosas, which originally sailed from the city in Georgia, the country, not the state, trying to transport approximately three tons of ammonia to the African country of Mozambique. And according to some of the reporters, the ship in itself was meant for a mining company operating in Mozambique who were trying to create a lot of explosions for the mining operations in Mozambique. With the ammonium nitrate itself coming from this facility in Georgia known as Rustavi Azot. With this particular facility most likely being the cheaper choice as opposed to some of the other facilities around the world. But apparently the Panama company that was operated by a Russian who allegedly owned the ship did not have enough money for the ship to pass through the Suez Canal. And so in order to make some money, they tried to take on extra shipment in the port of Beirut to essentially allow for the cheaper passage. But because the new shipment was essentially heavy machinery and the ship was already overloaded with ammonium nitrate, a major part of the ship ended up being damaged and was deemed unseaworthy by the authorities in the port of Beirut, which forced the ship to be stranded right here in Beirut for a very, very long time. And because the owner did not have enough money to repair the ship, nor did he have any money to pay for anything at this point, the crew of the ship ended up being stranded there for at least a year. And by the way, all of this was back in 2013. But by 2014, the ship was officially seized by the authorities because none of the bills were paid and nothing was done to repair the ship. And also on top of this, because the original company that ordered the product no longer was interested in it. And so the Russian owner of the ship decided to just abandon it along with the crew. But unfortunately, due to a lot of internal bureaucracy, and I guess in some sense due to the lack of regulations on what to do in this case, a lot of the cargo from the ship ended up being stored inside the port itself, while the ship itself simply was left to rot in the harbor, eventually sinking within about four years. By 2018, it was basically on the bottom of the ocean. And what happens after this? Well, I guess we know the story. The cargo was just stored there because nobody really wanted it, and the authorities could not figure out what to do with it or how to get rid of it mostly due to the internal bureaucracy, but also just because, well, that's just such an unusual case. And unfortunately, for some reason or another, at some point, there was a fire in the warehouse, and well, you know the rest. But along with the ammonium nitrate, the warehouse also had a bunch of fireworks, which you can actually even see exploding prior to the major explosion, and all of this most likely led to the spread of the fire, and then eventually the explosion. 
But the telltale sign of what exactly explored it was actually the cloud itself. It was the color of the cloud, the reddish cloud that you see, that's formed by the nitrogen dioxide. And nitrogen dioxide is a byproduct of a burning reaction of nitrates. And so when nitrates decompose, they usually produce this type of a color. And now a lot of new studies also established the total approximate power of this explosion and they also were able to calculate various other effects including the effects on the ionosphere which was mostly caused by this huge pressure wave you can see moving away from the center of the explosion. And strangely enough the explosion was so powerful that it led to various disturbances of electrons located really really high up in the Earth's atmosphere. Ionosphere being that upper layer of the Earth's atmosphere where a lot of electromagnetic effects are usually found, including things like, for example, northern lights. And so this explosion produced something that's about 1.12 kiloton of power, which is about 1 20th of the Hiroshima bomb, and the explosion then produced a really powerful shockwave that traveled southwards at a speed of about 0.8 kilometers per second or about 1600 feet per second with the wave then creating a kind of a bulge right here above the explosion. But what's interesting here is how all of this was discovered. The scientists whose study you can find in the description below were able to analyze all of this using data from various GPS satellites. Or basically by looking at the slight delays that the microwave signals from the GPS were experiencing compared to some of the other ground stations in the area, they were able to calculate the exact electron density present in certain parts of the ionosphere before, during and after the explosion. And the presence of electrons in the ionosphere generally affects the GPS signal and usually has to be calculated extremely precisely. And so the changes in the density of electrons above the explosion became apparent almost instantly. Mostly because a lot of the GPS in the area directly depends on a lot of these calculations in order to function properly. And these calculations also allowed the scientists to more precisely estimate how powerful the explosion was. So for example, they've established that this explosion was generally more powerful than a similar explosion that occurred in Wyoming back in 1996 that on paper at least was a lot more powerful. Truly making this tragic event one of the most powerful explosions, accidental non-nuclear explosions that have ever occurred on the planet. Something that unfortunately most likely occurred because of the human greed, human incompetence and complete disregard for human life. Something that could have been definitely avoided if the owner was more responsible, if he didn't abandon his crew and the ship or if the authorities in the port disposed of the cargo immediately. But unfortunately what's done is done. So let's just hope that something like this doesn't happen again. But because my personal interest in this was purely scientific, I encourage you to check out these papers by yourself because there's actually a lot of interesting stuff in them, including some of the more interesting comparisons to some of the other big explosions in the past. And more importantly, they also provide us with a lot of really cool techniques on how the scientists were able to establish the total yield of this explosion by, for example, using the audio from certain Twitter videos that I showed you previously and then literally calculating the approximate yield based on this information alone and the estimated distance from the location, which by itself is kind of mind-blowing. But on that note, well, check out all of the media and all of the relevant studies, including the Twitter videos in the description below. Subscribe if you still haven't. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Hopefully something tragic like this doesn't happen again. And, well, stay wonderful. Don't be like that guy who abandoned his ship and his crew. Be a wonderful person. Anyway, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.